I'm Rachel, a neuroscience student at University College London, and we're here at the Diamondis lab. While the nervous system is supported by thousands of cell types, its most critical building block is, of course, the neuron. Of all the cells in the body, neurons are arguably the most efficient at information processing, receiving and transmitting signals at 430 kilometers an hour. But what truly distinguishes nervous tissue is the remarkable connectedness of the cells, and the intricacies of their networks. When embryonic development begins, the organism is no more than a mass of undifferentiated cells. How does our intricate, multi-layered nervous tissue arise? Where did neurons come from? And do they keep forming once we're born? Today, we'll explain how unspecified cells become neurons during development through a process called neurogenesis. But first, let's do an overview. Number one, we'll have an introduction to the different types of neurons, so both excitatory and inhibitory. Second, we'll go over a review of neurulation and the neural tube anatomy. Third, we'll discuss nuclear migration and delamination from the ventricular zone. And under that, we'll also delve into symmetric and asymmetric cell division. And finally, fourth, we'll discuss the final locations of each of the neurons that have just been differentiated. There are two broad classes of neuron found in the adult nervous system, excitatory and inhibitory. Now, there's no morphological difference between them, so these labels are assigned based on the neurotransmitters that can be synthesized and released from their axon terminals. The excitatory neurons of the cerebral cortex are pyramidal and employ predominantly glutamate. They project their axons either locally or long distances. Conversely, Inhibitory neurons in the cerebral cortex release GABA in the brain and glycine in the rest of the body. There are three types in the cerebral cortex, stellate, basket, and chandelier. It's important to note that inhibitory cells project only locally. This will become relevant later when we discuss the origins of these cells in the developing nervous system. These cell types are important to distinguish as they originate in different regions of the neural tube and travel by different mechanisms. You'll remember from episode three that the neural plate, the thick layer of ectodermal tissue that's opposite the primitive streak, folds its edges dorsally into the neural tube. To orient you in the embryo, picture the center of the plate as running down the stomach and the edges then fold backwards towards the spine. This process, neurulation, which occurs during the fourth week of development, ends with the neural tube. This structure is made up of progenitors called neuroepithelial cells. These are the so-called stem cells of your brain, which can go on to form the brain and the spinal cord. The cells right at the fusion site are known as neural crest cells, and they give rise to most of the peripheral nervous system among other important cell types. The plate itself is made up of a single layer of columnar cells, and when it folds, the tube maintains the orientation of each cell. So all the faces of cells that were initially facing ventrally now face the inside of the tube. Those faces are called the apical side, and those that were initially facing dorsally, which are now on the outside, are called basal. Each cell is parallel with its neighbors, but the nuclei are at different distances from the apical surface, based on what stage of the cell cycle they're in. When these stem cells are ready to divide and give rise to progeny neurons, their nucleus migrate down its processes to the apical surface. The processes touch both the apical and basal surfaces throughout the entire neural tube. In reality, a support structure of radial glia also stretches across to both sides, acting as a scaffolding for the moving cell body. This movement is called interkinetic nuclear migration, and much research is currently investigating what about the apical surface influences the nuclei to divide, as we see no instances of mitosis on the basal side. The cells of the neural tube rely on mitosis to multiply, and they enter the M phase of the cell cycle when the nucleus is at the apical side of the tube. From there, the two daughter cells' nuclei migrate to the basal surface, where each cell can either repeat the cycle or exit the neural tube from the basal side, which is called delaminating. To understand how this process changes over the course of development, let's follow the fate of a single progenitor, a neural epithelial cell. Beginning at the basal side, the nuclei moves down, divides, 
and the two daughter cells migrate back, basically, where they both reinitiate the cycle. This is a symmetric division, since the daughters have the same fate, which is to remain as neural progenitors. If one daughter cell re-enters the cell cycle and one delaminated, then the division is asymmetric. The two cells could also both delaminate, which is another form of symmetric divisions, where both exit the cell cycle in the same generation to form adult neurons. The cells of the neural tube go through three patterns of division, which can be divided into two broader phases. It initially begins with predominantly symmetric progenitor divisions, in something called the expansion phase, where essentially the developing neural tube is increasing the volume of progenitors at its disposal to further differentiate. Asymmetric divisions then begin, where neurons can begin to delaminate from the tube, and once delaminated, they exit the cell cycle and therefore no longer produce any daughter cells. Finally, symmetric division resumes in the neurogenic phase, where all cells divide into two delaminating daughter neurons. To understand how this appears in the neural tube as time progresses, let's take a closer look at its anatomy. The pink region that you see here is made up of the progenitors, which are actively undertaking mitosis to create daughter cells. This area is called the ventricular zone. Now once the neurons and glia delaminate, they enter the blue region, which is called the mantle, and they exit the cell cycle. They will no longer divide any further. Now let's take a single slice from the tube to see how it structurally changes over time as the cells go through those earlier stages of expansion and neurogenesis. This is a single slice of the tube with a starting cell. Time passes as you move to the right. So let's note the key regions. First, the ventricular zone is where mitosis occurs. Next, we'll introduce you to a new zone called the subventricular zone, which acts as a major source of migrating neurons. So as you can see here, coming in from earlier stages, the subventricular zone is populated by migrating neurons. This region also contains neural stem cells, and most of the cell bodies of the radial glia reside in this area. Now, rather than being considered a mere structural component serving to guide these newborn neurons towards their final destinations, radial glia is now known to be a radial glia is now known to be a main source of neurons in several regions of the nervous system, notably in the cerebral cortex. Finally, we can see the cortical plate and the marginal zone, which are then filled in by the differentiating neurons as time progresses. This is what gives rise to those six layers of the cerebral cortex. They are entirely determined by the time that the neurons exit mitosis during development. We spoke earlier about the differences between excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and here is where that becomes important. Let's go back to viewing a cross-section of the tube. Now, there are two possible directions of migration. What we've seen so far is a movement from the inside moving out, progressively forming layers around the outside of the tube. However, inhibitory neurons operate differently, and rather than migrating progressively outwards, they originate from a single location in the tube and migrate tangentially to the rest of the brain and spinal cord. They move through the subventricular layer from the place where they exit the cell cycle, and when they reach the location they are meant to reside in in the adult, then they resume normal radial migration with the help of the radial glia. So here, we can see a structure that the neural tube forms in the anterior part of the embryo. Inhibitory interneurons form, and by that we mean they delaminate and differentiate, in a structure called the ganglionic eminence in the subpallium. Here, you can see that the location cross-sects the region between the olfactory bulb and the diencephalon. And there are two ganglionic eminences to note, the medial ganglionic eminence and the lateral. While debate persists about how long neural progenitors remain viable in adulthood, it's known that most of the neurons in the adult brain are present at birth. There are, however, locations where pluripotent neural stem cells reside that can form new neurons. These can be found in the subventricular zone of the lateral ventricular wall and the subgranular zone of the hippocampal dentate gyrus. 
Today, you've learned how neurons exit the cell cycle, how the cortical layers form, and how different neuron types migrate to their final adult locations. From here, we can go on to explore how the neurons know where to migrate to, what cells to project their axons and dendrites to, and what characteristics to take on as adults. From all of us here at NeuroPsyQ, thank you for watching.